must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Field, and we've got a first on the podcast today. We have our first ever father-daughter combination, (laughs) so I'm super excited about that. Dr. and Dr. McDaniels, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Why don't you guys give us a little bit of an intro and let our audience know who you are. Lita, we'll start with you. Ladies first. Thanks so much for having us. So my name is Lita McDaniel. I'm a physical therapist and finishing up an orthopedic physical therapy residency at Emory University and have been uh, just really excited to jump into physical therapy practice just a little bit over a year into practice, really enjoying it and also enjoying having a little bit of discussion, opportunity to teach with residency and discussion about teaching within physical therapy. I'm Mark McDaniel, and I'm a professor of psychological and brain sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. What I've concentrated on for the past about 40 years of my research is how people learn and remember. And I've had a big interest in the last, I guess, two decades in trying to translate basic principles that we have understood and developed in the laboratory, translate those principles into how to improve students learning and how to improve instruction in the classroom so that learners remember more, they understand more, and they transfer better. Yeah, I uh, have a a couple of points that I'd like to just bring up before we get started here. One, one of our co-hosts, Stephanie Wyrock, is actually, uh, she did her PT uh, schoolwork at St. Louis there, so she's a big fan. And Brandon and I are also both kind of fans because we love the book Make It Stick, and that uh, is something that we're going to talk about a little bit on the show today. Uh, we'll drop the link uh, so you guys can purchase that book. Uh, it it really changed a lot of the thought process of mine as far as you know teaching and learning. Thank you for that. It was uh, an amazing piece of work. But I personally was an awful student. I didn't know how to study. I didn't know how to learn. And this went all the way through grad school. I didn't really recognize how we learn until I got into my educational doctorate. And then I wished I had known all this stuff in hindsight, because I would have been a much better uh, learner. But if you guys wouldn't mind, maybe break it down a little bit and tell us, uh, this is kind of a loaded question, I know, but tell us how it is that we learn. What, what are the big processes? What are the big points on, on learning in general? Well, I'll go first. I think one of the big points is that we learn by constructing understanding. Put that into relief. Many people think that learning is sitting down and trying to memorize their assignment. And Generating an understanding means that you're building mental models of what causes what, what the effects are, how things relate together. And in so doing, memory follows. So if you understand something very well, you're going to remember many of the details later on. And you're going to remember the general gist and the general abstract concept a little bit better. So that brings me to another point. Good learning involves abstracting commonalities among surface features or superficial features, different kinds of examples. So in physics, the good physics learners are abstracting the essential features of what makes a work problem or what makes a problem on momentum or what makes a problem about force. So that's another thing. A third thing is we learn by making mistakes. And I think this is one of the the things that the educational system could do better at. So that is, I think 
maybe it's the students, maybe it's instructors, but there's an atmosphere in which students are afraid to make a mistake. They always want to be right, but we learn by making mistakes. Only by making mistakes do we have a diagnostic of where we don't ha quite have complete understanding. And then I think a, a, another thing is we learn by revisiting topics over time, spacing out over time. In our educational system, I think that we, we set up instruction and, we, it, and students uh, try to acquire information by massing their energies at one time frame or short time frame on, say, learning the bacteria of the large intestine. And then they move on, learn the bacteria of the small intestine, learn the bones, learn the major nerves radiating down the arm, and then they move on to the legs and that's it. But learning occurs when you revisit, you have new perspectives, you, knew, you have new frameworks for integrating things. It causes you to reactivate what you've been thinking about last week in terms of the nerves of the arm. And all those things are really good for learning, much better than massing your study where everything is in a working memory and then two days later it's gone. So what we need to do is create permanent knowledge structures and that happens by revisiting information. And I will say, Scott, that I think a critical point is that how learning takes place is often diametrically opposed to how people think they ought to learn. So many people think they ought to learn by reading over and over. So they, they think they're jamming information into memory. No, as a matter of fact, oftentimes when you're reading over and over, you get the sense that you're learning a lot because of cues of fluency and familiarity. And in fact, you're not learning much at all because you're not struggling to try to understand what you're reading. You're just, uh, you have a sense that you know it because it's familiar. So many times, and we know this from the literature, Scott, that when people use study methods that feel fluent and easy, they think they've learned a lot and they prefer those study methods later when they're given a choice. Study methods that are more challenging and are more difficult and where you struggle a little bit produce better learning, but learners feel as if that difficulty is signaling they're not learning much at all. So I'm not blaming people for not studying correctly. It's that the signals they're getting mislead them into thinking they're using effective learning approaches, and in fact, they aren't. So I think that's important to keep in mind. So I'll pass it along to Lita. Well, that was great. So I'll build off a couple of those points and try to put those back in a health education and clinical context for physical therapy. So I think the first one I want to mention, because it was the most recent one that you brought up, is this idea that study methods and effective, effective learning methods, we have this idea that we want a little bit of difficulty and a little bit of challenge to create positive adaptations or learning, uh, memory retention. And I think a nice analogy that I think of in the context of physical therapy is we expect those same challenges or desirable difficulties from our patients. So for example, if we have patients where we're trying to train for a strength gain, we have to overload that muscle tendon unit to produce strength gains. And some of the repercussions of that overload or that training may be a delayed onset muscle soreness or an uncomfortable feeling as a repercussion of that training. But it's desirable as long as we don't push it too far to the extreme because we're getting a training effect out of it. I think the same can be said for effective learning in which we produce a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of challenge and make the learning task appropriately challenging to facilitate retention of that information. If it's too easy, as Mark said, we kind of come up with this attribution or over attribution of our own competence and we're not really that good. Same idea in the clinic. If you give your patient yellow TheraBand rows forever and ever, they're going to feel like they're very strong and they get out into the real world and they're not actually that strong. So we want to gradually build up and utilize an appropriate level of challenge, but we do want to challenge our patients and our learners. The second point I'd like to build off of is the idea that we want the experiences in learning, we want learners to 
have opportunities to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And we want learners to have the opportunity to do that in a low stakes environment. So one of the learning tools that is commonly cited in the literature and that Mark has studied quite a bit is the idea of low stakes quizzing and low stakes testing. And that's one of the things that we really promote in teaching teachers, but also creating positive learning environments is this idea that we want people to have the opportunity to practice skills, whether it's a physical therapy skill, manual muscle testing, going to metric measurements, different types of assessment within a physical therapy environment. We want students to have the opportunity to practice those and make mistakes before we send them out into the clinic and they're forced to practice or perform with patients who they're, they're expected to have accurate measurement, accurate diagnosis, and effective treatment. We want them to be able to make the mistakes in the classroom before they go out. Instead of just being tested on those skills and given a grade, that's not very productive in terms of the students learning. Yeah, you know, Lita, you brought up uh, a couple good points there, and I want to revisit one of them that you guys kind of talked about, and it was creating that safe learning environment uh, and teaching teachers to do some of this stuff. Knowing what we do now uh, and some of the high points that you mentioned about learning and how we actually learn or some of the optimal ways that we learn, what are some recommendations then? What are some tips? What are some things that you guys show teachers in order to teach better? Uh, How do you implement some of this stuff when it comes to teaching? Scott, let's think first about generating understanding. So many teachers will just give students an assignment and they'll hope that students will read it and the hope is that students will try to generate good understanding of what they've read. Well, we can encourage students to do more than reread by asking them what what is called in the literature deep level questions. So you can encourage students to ask themselves why. Why is it that when you press a brake pedal that the car stops? And if the, if the student's learning about mechanical devices, or how is it that when the brake pedal is depressed that there's some signal that allows the brake shoes to close on the, on the, uh, on the drum? So deep level questions like why and how can be things that teachers construct for students to do in a study in a biology classroom, some instructors constructed a list of why questions to help the students organize and think about what they were reading in terms of digestion. So one question might be, why does saliva, why is saliva necessary to start the digestive process? So one thing we can do is have students try to push for understanding, getting them to ask why level and answer why level or deep level questions is effective. Another thing is encouraging students to try to teach what they're trying to learn to their roommate or to another student, because in teaching something effectively, we really have to understand it. Scott, I don't know about you, but I know that when, for me in my area of cognitive psychology, I really learned it well when I had to teach it, not so much when I was a student. Yeah, that's how you know you've mastered it when you can teach it to somebody else. That's right. That's right. So we we know from studies that if you just tell students you're going to have to teach this to somebody else, they learn it better than if they simply are expected to take an exam on it. If you do go ahead and try to teach a friend or your parent or somebody like that, it's as you mentioned, Scott, You things you explain well, you have direct evidence that you know it. Things you stumble on are the things you know you don't quite understand and you have to go back and work on more. So preparing to teach helps understanding. Actually trying to teach helps you check your understanding. So those are a couple things we can do as teachers to get students to generate understanding. Don't don't expect students to push for it on their own. Uh, Give them some tips. Give them some assignments even to have them try to push for understanding. That would be something that I would advise many teachers to do because I think, listen, it's easy for us as experts to think that when we're reading something, that we we build an understanding pretty readily because we're experts. So we have the feeling students are doing the same thing. Students aren't necessarily doing the same thing. We have to give them some scaffolding to do that. 
Yeah, I love that. Kind of goes into a little bit of that I talked about during my dissertation in Vygotskyanism, where mm-hmm. there is that scaffolding. And, and, and I needed that as a PT student because I was an English major. So I was coming over with, you know, very little math and science background. I had to take all my prerequisites just to get into the program. So I needed that scaffolding and then, you know, to be eased off little by little. I can definitely appreciate that for sure. And I guess having a chance for students, as Lita says, is a really great idea in a no stakes or low stakes environment to make errors. So one of the things that seems to be catching on around the country is a use of technologies like interactive response systems in the classrooms where you ask students questions, not factual questions, but questions that get at their underlying understanding. And what you're gonna find is a lot of students are making mistakes, but they're making mistakes in an anonymous way. They're entering the response, and then the instructor can show the range of responses to the whole class. And then everybody can see, wow, a lot of people don't understand this, just like I don't understand it. And it gives students a chance to take a chance and to make an error and then to learn from that error. So I think that's really what is a great thing that instructors can do. Just as Lita said, no stakes, low stakes questions that allow students to see the errors they're making, other people are making, and then to think about and discuss, well, where did I go wrong? Where was my thinking wrong? And in that way, try to build a more appropriate understanding. Yeah, I agree. So just one point to build off of that, I think the low stakes cuisine we've definitely emphasized there are multiple ways that you can implement that within a doctorate of physical therapy curriculum. So the clicker cuisine in class cuisine that Mark mentioned is one way. Um, Also online quizzes are quite effective, whether that's a fill in the blank or multiple choice, or even um, I've had some professors as a student and then as I've worked as an instructor kind of collaboratively created pin exam type questions online. So or anatomy or neuroanatomy or application based or visual type cuisine can be quite effective online as well as either preparation for class or review from a prior class or prior lecture. And then the other thing I wanted to emphasize is this idea that we can't overstate the importance of teaching as a learning tool. So I know I have taken advantage of this and had a really fantastic opportunity to serve as a teaching assistant throughout my time in my DPT curriculum at Ohio University. And I really feel like that was one of the most beneficial things for my own learning as well as enjoying it just for the teaching experience. I really feel like it helped me learn the information and the skills that I needed coming out of that program. And I just wanted to make the point that oftentimes we promote within our profession and a lot of professions that we should be lifelong learners. So we should continue to learn and strive to take continuing education courses and challenge our knowledge base and interact with other clinicians. But I would really emphasize that beyond just continuing to learn, I think each of us can start to teach. It's never too soon to start to teach. I think there's an expectation or maybe a belief that you need to be expert in something before you begin to teach. And I think that's really harmful and erroneous because we can gain a lot of benefit um, by teaching and preparing to teach, as Mark mentioned. So there's some literature that even before you engage in the act of teaching, just preparing to teach facilitates learning. And that's quite powerful. So I think putting ourselves in these situations where we're forced to teach, whether it's peer to peer, whether it's um, teaching within a, a DPT program. So some of the learning exercises that I've helped facilitate are students within PT programs teaching each other. And so for example, first year PT students who have just completed an anatomy course or a neuroanatomy course could put on a board prep review for third year students who haven't been in the anatomy lab in a couple years. And that's quite beneficial on both sides. So you get a little bit of board test prep review for the MPTE for third year students, but then the first years have an opportunity to teach. And we found that not only do students enjoy that interprofessional interaction, but they've reported that it 
does facilitate their learning. And we don't have data on this, but that's qualitative. And so that is something that I think is important. Another little tidbit, and this is actually going on at Ohio University. So one of my former professors is doing a qualitative study where he's surveying past DPT students from OU. And I actually had the opportunity to get interviewed by their research group. And they're trying to figure out and investigate via qualitative study how serving as a teaching assistant within a DPT program facilitates then confidence as a physical therapist and clinical competence. And they're benchmarking that based on board, board scores, licensing scores, um, GPA, and then qualitative structured interviews. And so I think that's a pretty neat project trying to assess the effects of teaching on subsequent learning. Yeah, you, you bring up a lot of great points, Lita. And I, I think, you know, being way more recently removed from the DPT program than, than myself, you're getting to see a lot more current events and real life activity and action, especially some of the new technology that's out there. I've seen it a little bit in uh, the, some of the two-year programs like Baylor University, where I did some adjunct work. And I love the use of technology and some of those quizzing systems and things, because I really do think that, that it benefits the student. And it does kind of help create that, that safe environment. But you guys talked about this a little bit earlier. I want to kind of circle back and, and, and do a deeper dive on this. But how can we use some of these techniques that we know uh, are helpful in, in learning and retention clinically with our patients? What are some of the ways that we can maybe see this stuff being used in the clinic? My first thought would be we can utilize the teaching to learn framework as well for our patients. And one of the methods that's been studied and that I utilize a little bit, but I think I could utilize more is the a method called teach back. So the teach back method. And so this has been utilized in the study I have in mind. It was used by nurses in an emergency room setting where they taught patients and communicated with patients discharge instructions from the ER. So what are the important things you need to do when you go home? Is it taking your medication, safety concerns, who do you need to follow up with? So they're just standard hospital discharge instructions depending on patient need. So these nurses utilized this teach back method in which they instructed the patient and they had the patient teach them back what was important, communicate back to them what was important, which is the teach back method. And what they found was better retention for ER discharge instructions. And I think we can utilize that in a physical therapy setting. In fact, I have. One of the ways that I do that is to kind of gauge in between session home exercise program compliance. So I will ask a patient, how, how did your exercises go over the past two days or the past week, depending on how frequently I've seen them. And then I will encourage them to teach me back what their exercises were. So show me what you've been doing. And that's just one simple example of utilizing the teach back method. If the patient is forced to describe to you the exercise, demonstrate the exercise, and then sometimes I'll even ask, why are you doing this exercise? Or what do you feel like you're getting out of this exercise? And that's another way for them to teach me what their understanding is of that exercise. And if there's, if they, if I didn't quite communicate it well, then we come up with that. So I figure out a better way to do that. But then I also gauge their understanding and their practice of that particular, particular skill. And we can adjust based on their performance or their accuracy for that exercise technique. Yeah, I love that. I've, I've used that before. And actually, um, a quick story that I think I might have told on this podcast ages ago, there was a t uh, type 2 diabetic patient whose blood triggers were running in the three 400 range pretty constantly, and uh, it was having to go on insulin. And so uh, they showed him how to uh, inject his insulin using an orange and, and they would inject the insulin they sent him off and he came back a couple weeks later and his blood sugars were still running four and 500 even worse and they said you know well you know this doesn't seem right what's going on like can you show us how you're injecting your your insulin and he said yeah i just need an orange and they said what and he said yeah just give me an orange so they got him an orange and he, they brought it in sure enough he was taking an orange and injecting it with insulin mm -hmm. and then you know sometimes he'd eat it sometimes he wouldn't but like you know, the, the disconnect was, wasn't, you know, for them, they thought they had taught him properly how to inject himself, you know, with an orange, but somewhere along the line, they didn't tell them that he would be doing that on himself. So he wasn't getting his insulin. And, uh, you know, again, just a simple miscommunication, but 
that teach me, uh, you know, and tell me back. I think it's one of the O'Sullivans, if not both of them. They they use that that technique of, you know, tell me what you learned here today. If you were to go and tell it to your significant other when you get home tonight, you know, that's a really great uh, method that that uh, like you said, you use in the clinic, and I, I can see that being very helpful. And Scott, let's take that example a little bit further. So maybe if the people were telling the uh, person to inject the orange, as an example, we're telling them why the insulin was necessary and why he was doing it, then he would have had a better understanding that the injection of the orange was an analogy or a surface feature that really the, the concept is you got to get that insulin into your body so that you can handle the excess right. sugars. So it's one of those things where we just kind of get so used to it and, right. and, and it's right. like secondhand. We just say, all right, here you go. You inject it. Boom. You got it. Good. All right. 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 You know, we just fall into that trap and we got to take it that extra step. We do. And as teachers, it's the same thing that we think the connections are so obvious that we don't take time to try to make those connections or help the students make the connections. Yeah. Again, as teachers, we have a lot of knowledge. It seems like it all fits together and it does for us, but we have to recognize for students often, they see this information as bits and pieces of arbitrary uh, pieces that don't really fit together into a whole. And so one thing that I recommend is somehow we try to make, we, we try to understand that novice students see a lot of this information as arbitrary and we have to try to help them understand it's not arbitrary, that it really does fit into a bigger picture and we have to help them understand that model and those interconnections. I want to go back again and talk a little bit about something you talked about before. You just kind of made me think about it. But again, me being a, an English major and coming into the world of physical therapy, I was a novice, like, you know, in the world of science in general. So I hope that I can take that information in my experience and recognize that students are coming in at that level. Some may be a little higher, but some are not. One of the things that down the line we should strive for, and I think we hope our students strive for eventually as well through lifelong learning, is becoming an expert, right? And, and shooting for expertise in our field. And one of the things that I, I've seen in a lot of studies that the difference between a novice and an expert is reflection, and I know, you know, you've talked about revisiting things and going back to them and re-examining them. How important is reflection when it comes to practice in general, but also striving toward expertise? I can say that one area in cognitive psychology has to do with developing expertise. And one of the main researchers in that was a professor named Anders Ericsson that he sadly just passed away. But one of the contributions he made was that it's not just how much you practice. It's, it's conducting deliberate practice. And deliberate practice essentially is reflection. So when you're practicing, you're reflecting on, have I achieved my goal? Where have I not achieved my goal? What, what do I need to do to get better? All of that is reflection. Um, and, and it's the same, and, and so, in general, in becoming an expert, you're reflecting on how does this knowledge tie in with this other thing? Where do I have gaps in my understanding? How might I apply this knowledge to a new domain I'm interested in? All of those things are basically metacognitive reflections. And it means that you're not blindly acquiring information and memorizing information. It means you're constructing purpose for that information. You're reflecting on how far you've gotten in that goal and where you need to go and what you need to do to get there. So it's thinking about your goals, thinking about how you want to use the knowledge, thinking about the distance between where you are now and where you need to be, thinking about techniques you can use to, to reduce that gap. All of that is reflection, Scott, and, and all of that's really important. I, I got to ask you guys about this because... A, this just doesn't happen very often, and B, we've never had this combination on, on the podcast. So you guys have got some research that you've been working on together. Is that right? Is it a paper, poster, presentation? What do you guys got going on here? Yeah, so a few things kind of in the works as we roll into fall, but some of the things that we were really excited to take on earlier this year, in February, Emory University, where I'm currently a resident, um, invited us to come teach 
a continuing education course for their clinical instructors on learning science as applied to physical therapy clinical education. So that was a really nice opportunity for us to kind of roll out this collaboration of utilizing Mark's expertise in learning science and some of the techniques that I've tried to utilize both in my teaching in formal academic settings, but also in the clinic and clinical settings. So that was a really nice opportunity. We are hoping to offer those in the future and trying to come up with a way that we can tailor those materials to DPT programs. However, as you know, many of our learning and teaching opportunities have become online. And so we're currently trying to play with how those materials might be most effectively delivered in an online format. Obviously, it's more attractive to do it in person in workshops where we can have students, clinical instructors, engage in these laboratory-based activities because as we know, we want them to practice what we're teaching so that they learn most effectively. So it's kind of this meta idea of they're learning how to learn, they're learning how to teach, and we want them to be active in that process. So we're currently trying to come up with methods to transfer that type of workshop online, whether it's to DPT programs, students, and also instructors within those programs to try to engage in more effective teaching strategies, but also really to clinical instructors who may not have a teaching background, most don't, or an academic background, so that they can be more effective in guiding these students in a clinical setting. The other thing that we're excited about and we're hoping goes through is we've worked on a, we have a paper submission currently in process, the Journal of Humanities and the Rehab Sciences, and so that's something that we've worked on to, again, try to communicate both the research that Mark has done and the applications that we feel are appropriate and effective within physical therapy settings. And how was it working together? What was that experience like? Well, Scott, for me, it was really fabulous on two levels. One is it was just a, just a wonderful experience to uh, see my daughter be so accomplished and to take some of the ideas that I've been working on for years and translate those into concrete uh, actionable things that people might do in the health science instruction. But on another level, it was really professionally very gratifying in as much as after we wrote Make It Stick, we've received a lot of invitations to go and talk to all kinds of people, law schools and health sciences and arts and sciences and universities, and feel very comfortable about my confidence in how the research could translate into the classroom. But I'm presenting this at a level that's somewhat abstract. I'm not telling instructors how to actually interpret that in terms of their own classroom activities. And certainly not for physical therapy. I know very little about that. So professionally, just extremely sad to be able to talk about a learning science principle and some of the basic research. In other words, talking about why one would want to do this, and then seeing Lita develop it so beautifully in the PT context. So it, just to see it being realized in the things that clinical instructors and instructors and students could do in their day-to-day -day activities to learn more, how to actualize these principles into particular content that's challenging in the PT world. So it was a thrill. And in fact, that was kind of a gap between our make it stick and then how people are going to apply it. A lot of people say, okay, I got it. I, I, I think I know what I want to do. But many other instructors are emailing pretty regularly and saying, okay, you say I need to use low stakes testing. How do I do it every day? Do I do it every other day? How long do I give this? Well, what's the delay between my lecture and the test? All of those parameters are things we really can't give much information on because they're not in the science. But somebody who's teaching that can give some pretty good advice about those particular concrete aspects. So it was just great to see the going from the more abstract and the science and the experiments to really very uh, well thought out recommendations from Lita about how it, would, how it would look in the PT training environment. Awesome. It's just been great. Well, we have to ask this one final question we ask all of our guests on the show. If you could change one aspect of higher education, whether it be DPT or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you change it? Okay, well, I'll go first. I think Lita wants me to go first here. Well, Scott, I, I've been thinking, of, here's what I think I would change. I think that today we have some very thoughtful and expert instructors who try very hard to give the best course they possibly can. But it's still the case that students have to leave the classroom and on their own try to learn the material. So I think for me, the 
biggest change I would want to make is to include in our curricula instruction to students on how to learn so that students could have a toolkit of activities that they could apply to their different learning challenges in an effective way so they could self-regulate their learning. And then if you've got a great instructor, good, you're going to learn even more. If the instructor is not so good, your self-regulated learning tools are going to help you gain the expertise that you need. I think we spend far too much time on teaching students what they need to know and not enough time on how they should approach the learning task. And the thing I'm working on right now, Scott, really has become one of my main thrusts is how do you train students in these learning strategies so that students will use them, so that they'll commit to them, so that they self-regulate these strategies across a range of content and a range of challenge. And it's not straightforward. I, we don't have time to go into today's podcast, but I could talk more about that. And we're working hard on identifying the elements and the components that might go into an instructional package for that. Awesome. that. That's what I would do. I see that. I just want to say one further thing. There's a lot in of discussion in education now about more equity in education. I think this is one avenue that we can attack that would bring a lot of equity. If part of the curricula was to help those students figure out how to learn, train them how to learn, then I think... Uh, yeah, most, I, I didn't know what I didn't plan. know until it was way too late. I was yeah. in an EDD program, and by the time I figured out, I was doing it wrong. So, And Lita, how about your perspective? Well, I think, I don't, I'm not sure this is mutually exclusive from Mark's point, but it is a little bit different flavor. And I think the key thing that I would change, not because it was necessarily a downfall of mine, but... What I would change is the grading system and the focus on grades. So I think, unfortunately, the fact that tests are graded, assignments are graded, grades are necessary for passing classes, moving on to the next year of a DPT curriculum or program, there is something to knowledge assessment, but I think grading is not the same thing as knowledge assessment. And I think the undue focus on grades as a stand-in for knowledge assessment is harmful to students in a few different ways. So one, it's incredibly stressful. So it produces maybe maladaptive or poor mental health, stress, anxiety on the part of the students who are going through this demanding program. But secondly, it doesn't really align with what we're trying to do, the goals of our DPT program, which is to prepare students to be entry-level physical therapy clinicians. And I think if that is our ultimate goal, then we can come up with a little bit better way to assess skill proficiency than just assigning grades. So I, I don't have a perfect solution for that. And I think deconstructing the best way to do that, again, is another conversation. But I feel like there is some room for growth in that aspect of our DPT curricula. For sure. I love that. I mean, number and letter grades are kind of a little bit outdated. We could just go with proficient or needs more work. You know, one of that might, might help a lot of things. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time and for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Where can people reach out and follow up with you if they have uh, questions or they just want to check in and see what you guys are up to these days? I'm active. I, I do have a professional blog site that I try to stay active on. I have an Instagram account, but I'm less good at that. Uh, but my, my tag is Sapiens Moves. So my website is sapiensmoves.com and we can throw that in the show links. My contact information is on that website. So if people are curious about having us out for a workshop, feel free to email me. Probably a little bit less important and more reachable than Mark is. However, he's been incredibly gracious with his time and extending his expertise within the physical therapy community. So I really appreciate that. But that's how you can reach me. Scott, I'm, I'm not really, I'm kind of a dinosaur. I don't have a you know, website or a Facebook or anything like that. Just have an old fashioned email, Mark McDaniel at W-U-S-T-L. That's for WashU St. Louis. Edu. Great. And we'll put all those links in the show notes so people can reach out to you. Again, thank you guys so much for your time and for coming on here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much. That, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Oh, I will say that Make and Stick has a website where we post some 
information on Make It Stick and okay. and um, so I'll share some of the things instructors have tried, things like that. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll drop that okay. in the show notes as well. Because I, I okay. like I said, I love the book. Uh, I know Brandon loves the book as well. We were both very, I guess we just nerded out over it. You know, we were very excited to, <laughs> to shoot the breeze about that book once we both read it. So thank you for all you guys do um, and keep up the great work. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare a telehealth platform is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.